you doing, Rock family? Our speaker today is one of those brainy guys. You know, your pastor is not really a brainy guy. This guy's a brainy guy. He's actually Billy Graham, the greatest evangelist in the history of the planet. This is Billy Graham's grandson. But that's not his claim to fame. His claim to fame is God's anointing on his life. Pastor Tulian Chavijan uh, is a pastor in Florida. He's also a professor and uh, just a great guy. I met him 25 years ago in Florida, and ever since then, God has blown up his ministry. Uh, he's going to be an incredible blessing to you. He's going to make you think. So get your thinking caps on, and I want you to give a warm, strong, rock welcome to Pastor Tulian. I love, love San Diego. I am a Florida native, okay, uh, born in Florida, raised in South Florida, Fort Lauderdale, and I have told lots of people that the only other place I could live and be happy outside of Fort Lauderdale is San Diego. Not because of you guys, but because of the weather, all right? It's the most comparable. Uh, this really is one of my favorite places in the country, and it's a real privilege and an honor for me to be here. This is my first time at the Rock Church, and I'm glad to be here. I am on vacation. I've been on vacation all summer, and I am on vacation, and I never, ever, ever accept an outside speaking invitation uh, in the months of June, July, or August. But when this one came, came in, I decided to interrupt my vacation and come uh, because I wanted to be here with you and I'm super grateful for the work that God is doing uh, here in this church and through this church and throughout the other churches in this city. Let me just say before I get into what I want to say this morning, let me just say that uh, your pastor butchered my name, okay? <laughs> butchered my name. That was probably the worst pronunciation of my name I've ever heard. And you can imagine, I've heard a lot, okay? Um, it's Tullian, not, I don't even know what he, Twillian, I think he said. Tullian, the last name is Chavijan, which rhymes with religion, if that helps. It's a terrible, terrible last name. I've often thought about dropping it. Uh, I'm like, Beyonce did it. Prince did it, Madonna has done it, why can't I do it? Um, but I've decided to keep it. Uh, but yeah, Chavijan rhymes with religion. I don't know if that helps, probably not, but um, it really is a privilege for me to be here. So let me get right into it. Um, the title of my message this morning comes from the title of a book of mine that is coming out in the fall called One Way Love. And the subtitle of that book is Inexhaustible Grace for an Exhausted World. And I want to focus our attention this morning on Luke chapter 4, the Gospel of Luke chapter 4, and I want to talk about exhaustion because I am absolutely convinced that if you are anything like me at all, regardless of whether you're younger or older, man or woman, you're exhausted. There are two kinds of people in this world. People who are exhausted and admit it, and people who are exhausted and try to suppress it or deceive themselves into thinking that they're not. But the fact of the matter is, if you're anything like me, you're exhausted, you're tired. Every single person I talk to, regardless of what stage in life they're in, is exhausted for a variety of different reasons. So I wanna talk about exhaustion this morning, but before we get into that specifically, I wanna focus your attention on Luke chapter four, beginning in verse 16 and reading down through verse 21. Luke chapter four, beginning in verse 16, reading down through verse 21. Luke says, and he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. The spirit of the Lord is upon me 
because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And may God use this familiar passage to awaken us to the radicality of his amazing grace. Let's pray together. Come thou fount of every blessing and tune our hearts and our minds to see and to savor your amazing grace. Your unconditional love that comes our way minus our merit. I pray that our hearts would be freshly gripped by the hilarity of your love and your grace towards sinners like me. I pray, Father, that you would set us free this morning, set all of us free. I pray that each and every one of us would leave here this morning feeling lighter, recognizing that if we are in Christ, we live our lives under a banner that reads, it is finished. And that we would be freshly gripped by the fact that everything has already been done. So help us, we pray. We need you, O oh God, to be the one who preaches loudly and clearly. Overpower our unbelief. Open our eyes, soften our hearts. Give us ears to hear. You know us better than we know ourselves. Nobody is here by accident. Every single one of us are here by divine appointment. And that means that you have something very, very, very specific to say to each and every one of us. So say it. Say it compellingly. Say it clearly. Say it convincingly. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So I don't know about you, but I'm exhausted, all right? I just turned 41, and that was a much easier birthday to digest than the one the year before. I was depressed for about four months after I turned 40 because I feel like I'm 18, and the idea that half of my life is most likely over was very depressing to me. Uh, well, I turned 41 and that was easier. I've sort of grown into the fact that I'm becoming an older man and I'm beginning to be okay with that, but I'm just tired. I have two teenage boys, a prepubescent girl. I didn't even know what that meant until my wife said it the other day. She's like, I said, why has Jenna been so emotional lately? She's almost 12. She said, well, honey, my wife said, well, honey, she's prepubescent. I said, I don't even know what that means. Sounds kind of gross, but I'm assuming you know what you're talking about. Um, but just life, marriage, parenting, uh, just the, the demands, the pressures, the relational tensions, all of these things contribute to our weariness. In fact, every single person, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, every single person that I talk to, when you get beneath the surface, finally admits that they're tired, that they're weary, that they're exhausted in one way, shape, or form. I mean, people are exhausted emotionally, people are exhausted physically, people are exhausted spiritually, people are exhausted relationally. I read this statistic not long ago, and it was astounding to me. A guy by the name of Richard Leahy, Dr. Richard Leahy, who's an anxiety specialist, said this. The average high school kid today has the same level of anxiety as the average psychiatric patient in the early 1950s. It's amazing, and I can verify that because I have two teenage boys. Um, and uh, everybody I talk to, wherever I go, 
acknowledges, admits, confesses when you begin to get beneath the surface that they're in fact tired. I mean, the fact is that real life is long on law and short on grace. I mean, the, the, the demands never stop, the failures pile up, fear sets in. I mean, think about it. Life requires many things from us. It requires a successful career, a a stable marriage, well-behaved and emotionally adjusted children, a certain quality of life. I mean, when life gets hard, the hardworking work harder. Is it any wonder at all that all of us are so tired? I mean, we do our best to do more, to do better, to do now. I mean, the cultural pressure we feel to take care of ourselves and make it happen, whatever that is, by working harder and working smarter wears us out. I mean, every single one of us live with long lists of things to accomplish and people to please and situations to manage. I mean, anyone living inside the stress and the strain and the uncertainty of daily life knows from instinct and heart experience that the weight of life is very, very heavy. Exhaustion may be the common point of experience for every human being on the face of this earth. So regardless of what stage of life you're in, you may be physically exhausted because you're old. I'm shocked at uh, things that I'm not able to do that I used to be able to do five years ago, just physically. I mean, it's a reminder that my, my body is getting more and more tired with each passing day. Relationships are hard. Parenting is hard. The demands that we feel from the workplace are hard. The societal pressure to make something of ourselves and to make it happen and to create a manu- manufacture a controllable world that we can ensure our own safety in. I mean, all of these things make us tired. We're worn out. We're all in need of some relief. So I wanna, I wanna ask, two questions this morning and then provide you with an answer to each question. I want to ask the question, what's the cause of our exhaustion? It's not what you think it is. It's not just that our kids are demanding or life is hard. It's deeper than that. It's not just that. It's that, but it points to something deeper. I want to ask what's the cause of our exhaustion and then I want to answer the question, what's the cure for our exhaustion? It's just two things. What's the cause of our exhaustion? What's the cure for our exhaustion? First, what's the cause? I mean, where does exhaustion come from? Robert Capon, who is uh, a writer that I enjoy reading, wrote this, and I think he really, really, really gets to the root cause of our exhaustion with this sentence. And he wrote this as an older man, so he, he lived long enough to know something about life and what causes us to become so tired and causes us to be so weary. He wrote, the greatest temptation in life is to think that it is by further, better, and more aggressive living that we can find life. You see, the reason we're so tired isn't simply because our children are difficult or that life is busy or that the demands at work keep piling up. That's not the reason. That's not the ultimate cause of our exhaustion. The reason we're so tired is that we are trying to save ourselves. Let me explain what I mean. Because it doesn't matter who you are, whether you're a Christian or not a Christian, whether you're old or young, rich or poor, healthy or sick, it doesn't matter. Every single human being is trying to save themselves. Non-Christians do it, Christians do it, everybody does it. Each and every one of us are addicted to what I call self-salvation projects. Let me explain what I mean. If, If the cause of our exhaustion isn't simply the difficult circumstances in life, but it's something that's going on inside of us that produces exhaustion, that makes us weary when we look at our circumstances, then what is it? Well, the reason we're so tired is because we're desperately trying to rescue ourselves. 
Let me, let me give you a word and then define it. Every single one of us is addicted to performanceism. Okay, and that's a word I just made up. That's okay. Um, I'm gonna define it, and you can make up words if you define it. Um, <laughs> every single one of us is addicted to performanceism. I mean, and let me explain what I mean by performanceism. Performanceism is the mindset that equates our identity and value directly with our performance. Okay, your performance as a husband, your performance as a mom, your performance as a worker, your performance as a friend, your performance as a wife, your performance, you name it, okay? Performanceism is the idea that equates our value, our worth, our identity with how we perform. So performanceism sees achievement not as something we do or don't do, but something we are or aren't. There's a difference there. So, for instance, the colleges that we attended are more than the places where we were educated. They are labels that define our value. Okay, they, they, those are, they're labels that define our value to ourselves, to other people, to society. The money that we earn, the car that we drive, isn't simply a reflection of the job we have. They are a reflection of us, who we are. How I look, how intelligent I am, how my kids turn out, what other people think about me is synonymous with my worth. That's what I mean by performanceism. So in the world of performanceism, success equals life and failure equals death. Which is why when we are struggling, if you're a parent, when we're struggling with our children and we, our oldest son uh, made the last year of his life at home this past year our most painful year, seriously. It was unbelievably difficult. He pushed every button and crossed every boundary and it was incredibly painful, incredibly painful. And I mean, my wife and I lived in a perpetual state of fear and stress and anxiety. He leaves four weeks from Wednesday to go to college. Four weeks, I've counted, okay? I have literally, I was telling my friend Dwayne the other day, I have, this past year I have sat in the shower with the water hitting my face counting. One, two, three, counting the days when he goes to college, till he goes to college. Now I'm gonna miss him, I love him, he's one of my best friends, but he needs to get out of the house, all right? My wife, Kim, and I, I think they've got a picture of her. My wife, Kim, and I have three, there she is. Don't we look happy? That's because we know that in four weeks and four days. <laughs> we got married at 21, and we had Gabe, our oldest, at 22 and Nathan at 24, and Jenna at 28, and the goal has always been the same. Bring them into this world while we are young so they will leave our home when we are still relatively young. The whole goal has been get to the empty nest. Whole goal. Get them in, get them out. Okay, so the first one is leaving in four weeks and three days, and given the year we just experienced with him, we could not be more excited about this, all right? But we did live, I mean, I joke about it now, but I mean, this was a really, really painful year. We lived in a perpetual state of fear and stress and anxiety. And there were times when I asked Kim in conversation, we talked about, okay, well, what is it? Is, is it just because we're afraid he's gonna make a mess of his life? Why do we live in this perpetual state of fear? I mean, if John says that perfect love casts out all fear and you know, plenty of places in the Bible we're told not to fear, I mean, what is causing our fear and our anxiety which is producing tremendous exhaustion? What is it? Well, there is a sense, and this is true for all of us as parents, there is a sense in which our worth, our value, our identity is wrapped up in how our kids turn out. So if, if our kids don't turn out well, I am, as a person, a failure. 
And if my kids turn out okay, I am as a person a success. This is what I mean by performancism. We're enslaved to this. Um, I grew up playing tennis. Um, and I got my first tennis racket when I was seven years old and I grew up playing tennis, played every day, started playing competitively by the time I was about 10 and was really good. And everybody around me, people who knew tennis and people who didn't know a whole lot about tennis, all said the same thing. You can really go somewhere. You've got a tremendous amount of potential. You've got natural skill, natural giftedness in playing tennis. And I loved hearing that stuff. I mean, it really made me feel like I mattered. But I had a problem. Every time I would lose a point, a game, a set, or a match, I would throw a John McEnroe-like temper tantrum. I mean, I would curse, I would spit, I would break my rackets, and my parents and my coaches were constantly saying, dude, I mean, just relax. There's always tomorrow. I mean, why would it rip me apart when I would lose a point? Well, I didn't know this then, but I know this now, that hearing for so long people tell me how good of a tennis player I was and that I could really go somewhere with my tennis playing and become someone as a tennis player, I started to equate my tennis playing with my identity. And so every time I would lose a point or a game or a set or a match, it actually threatened my identity. It was deeper than just losing a game. There's always tomorrow, you can win a game tomorrow. I mean, it was deeper than that. For me, every lost point game set and match threatened my identity because I had concluded that if I didn't become the best, I would be a nobody. If I didn't win, then I didn't count. I was suffering the weight of what Paul Zoll calls the law of capability. Let me tell you what he means by that, okay? It's a quote, the law of capability, and all of us feel the weight of the law of capability. He defines it this way. If I can do enough of the right things, I will have established my value. Identity is the sum of my achievements. So if I can satisfy the boss, meet the needs of my spouse and children, and still pursue my dreams, then I will be somebody. In Christian theology, this is called justification by works. It assumes that my worth is measured by my performance. On the other side, it conceals a ghastly fear. If I do not perform, I will be judged unworthy. To myself, I will cease to exist. So when I talk about the fact that the cause of our exhaustion is not just the difficult circumstances in our lives, but it's our trying to save ourselves, this is what I mean. We're exhausted because we're trying to generate our own value and significance and meaning and security by what we do and by who we can become. That's what's caused, it's not just that my 18 year old son was rebelling and I love him and I don't want him to hurt himself. That wasn't the, that that wasn't the primary cause of my exhaustion and the primary source of my fear. It was more than that, it was deeper than that. It was, who am I if you don't turn out okay? If you don't turn out okay, I will have lost meaning in life. In other words, what my wife and I had done unconsciously is turn our son into an idol. I mean, you know, when the Bible describes idolatry, it's not just talking about a wooden statue that people in far off lands and galaxies far away bow down to. Idolatry is, an idol is anything. It could be a good thing. Oftentimes it's a good thing, a gift from God. A good thing that we turn into an ultimate thing, something that we look to to invest our lives with meaning and worth and security and significance, which means that if you're married, your spouse can be your idol. If you're depending on your husband or your wife to provide for you what only Jesus can provide for you, to do for you what only Jesus can do for you, then you've turned your spouse into an idol. Your kids can become an idol. If you, you, you know this, if, you're, if your kids, uh, and this is what my wife and I had to face this past year, uh, if you can't live, 
If you don't even want to consider living anymore when your kid goes off the rails, that's a sure sign that you've turned your child into an idol. It could be your work. I tell people at our church, it, it's preach, it can be preaching for me. I mean, part of the reason I spend so much time preparing sermons and enjoy preaching sermons is because this is my chance to generate my own worth. If you think I'm a good preacher, I'm a success. If you think I'm a bad preacher, I'm a failure. Here's my shot to save myself again. So we turn good things into idols. We turn good things into ultimate things, things that we depend on to, to give us meaning and worth and value and all, of those, and all of those things. So when I say that we're exhausted because we're trying to save ourselves, this is what I mean. We're inescapably addicted to self-salvation projects. We feel the burden to make it, to get it done, to impress, to earn, to succeed, to be validated. Why? Because our very identity is at stake. I remember when I wrote my first book in 2007, um, I checked my Amazon rankings 100 times a day. Now, if you're familiar with Amazon, you know that Amazon ranks books, and the higher you get to number one, the more your book is selling, and the further away you get from number one, the less your book is selling. I was astonished, okay, so terribly narcissistic. You, you are too. I'm just free enough to admit it, all right? Uh, as Jack Miller used to say, cheer up, you're a lot worse off than you think you are, but God's grace is infinitely greater than you could ever ask for or imagine. Okay. This whole thing's not riding on who you are and what you can become and what other people think of you. Thank God. So I'm free to stand up and say, narcissistic Tullian looked at my Amazon rankings a hundred times a day when my first book came out. And, um, and I remember like it was yesterday, on those days where it was rising, I, I felt, it wasn't just, oh, that's good news. I actually felt like a success. And on days when it had fallen, I would, I mean, I was in a bad mood, literally. It affected my mood. Well, why? Now, we, we all do this in a thousand different ways, okay? For you, it's not Amazon rankings, perhaps, but it's something else. It's, it's the way your coworker thinks about you. It's, it's the relationship you have with your spouse. It's whether or not your kid's paying attention to what you're saying or ignoring you. I mean, we all have this in a thousand different ways. Um, but what was going on as I was checking my, I mean, it, my identity was anchored in whether the book was selling or not. Trusting in a ranking or book sales to provide for me what only Jesus has pr pr promised to provide. So, um, so if the cause of our exhaustion is the drive to save ourselves, and what I mean by save ourselves is trying to set ourselves free by getting value and worth and meaning and all of those things for ourselves, that the burden is on us to go out and get these things and secure for ourselves these things. If the cause of our exhaustion is the drive to save ourselves, well, what's the cure? Well, this is what Jesus says here. You gotta you know, picture the scene, okay? He goes back home, Nazareth, goes to the synagogue, um, he's sort of the guest of honor there because he's a hometown boy and they give him the scroll to read, the reading for that day and he reads from Isaiah and he sits down and he says, everything I just read is talking about me. And if you go back to the Old Testament, you realize that the Old Testament is one story. It tells one story and it points to one figure. It tells, I mean, from Genesis chapter three onward, when God said in the garden, after Adam and Eve sinned, I will send a rescuer. This is the way he said it. The seed of the woman will one day come and crush the head of the serpent. In other words, I am coming to clean up the mess that you guys made. While your sin reaches far, my grace reaches farther, there is one coming who will clean up the mess that you made. And the entire Old Testament is the unfolding and development, the growing of that promise in Genesis chapter three, verse 15. So that by the time we get to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it's like, this is the fulfillment of everything that guys in the Old Testament were talking about. So Jesus stands up, reads from Isaiah, sits down and goes, you know what Isaiah was talking about way back then? I'm, I'm the guy. I'm the guy. And he says, essentially, he gives, he, he gives us his mission statement here, what he came to do. 
And he says, I came to set the captives free. The whole reason I'm here is to liberate the oppressed, to set the captives free. Well, when Jesus announces that he came to set the captives free, we have to ask, well, free from what? I didn't even know I was a slave. What are you talking about? I mean, free from what? Free from the slavery of having to rescue ourselves. Free from the pressure of having to make it on our own. Free from the demand to measure up, the burden to get it all right, the obligation to fix ourselves and find ourselves. You know, the church is packed with fixers. It's terrible. Who wants to be around someone who's trying to fix you? No one. Okay, I mean, for whatever reason, the church in America has concluded that this whole thing is about behavioral modification. And so my divine calling from God, I was sent to this earth to fix you. You wonder why your marriage is hurting. You got to, I mean, my wife and I, the first five years we were married, we were miserable. And the reason was because we spent the first five years of our marriage trying to fix one another. I concluded that our marriage would be wonderful if she would just become more like me. And she concluded that our marriage would be amazing if he would just become more like me. And so we spent the first five years of our lives trying to fix each other. Well, listen, every attempt, every attempt to fix another person is really a down deep attempt to fix ourselves. Because what we're saying in our attempts to fix another person is, I need you to become a certain way if I'm going to be happy. When I talk about self-salvation projects, I know that may be a foreign phrase, but that's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about I, I, need to, I need to get happiness for myself, and I've concluded that the best way to do that is to fix all of the people in my life so that my life will be easier and I'll be happier. Well, Jesus comes to free us from that. When he says, I've come to set the captives free, he came to liberate us from the obligation to fix ourselves and to find ourselves. He came to free us from the slavish need to be right and rewarded and regarded and respected. One of the reasons we're so tired is because we spend all of our lives working fighting to be right, to be rewarded, to be regarded, to be respected. Why? Because we think that those things, if we can just get those things, those things will invest our lives with meaning and worth and value. They'll invest our lives with salvation. We will finally be saved and we'll finally be free. Because Jesus came to set the captives free, life doesn't have to be a tireless effort to establish ourselves and justify ourselves and validate ourselves. I mean, we don't need to spend our lives trying to get to the front or control outcomes or manufacture a safe, controllable existence. That's what makes us so tired. We do it with our kids. We do it with other people in our lives. We do it with ourselves. That's why we're tired. We don't have to live under the weight of making all of our dreams come true if we're going to matter. That's what he came to set us free from. This is the good news. Because Jesus won for me, I'm free to lose. Because Jesus was strong for me, I'm free to be weak. Because Jesus was someone, I'm free to be no one. Because Jesus was extraordinary, I'm free to be ordinary. Because Jesus succeeded for me, I'm free to fail. Our hope, ultimately, is not anchored in our transformation or our spouse's transformation or our child's transformation. Our hope is ultimately located in Christ's substitution. That he came to do for us and be for us what we could never do or be for ourselves. He said, listen, I didn't come to abolish the law. I came to fulfill it. I came to be for you what you could never be for yourself. I came to do for you and to secure for you what you could never do for yourself and secure for yourself because Jesus won for you, you're free to lose. You know how radically different your relationships would be if you understood that? I mean, so much of the relational tension we experience is our needing to win. You know, 
I mean, I just, we need to win. We need to win with our kids. We need to win in this moment. I have to prove my point. I have, I mean, I have to, I have to get something from you that I think I need in order to be happy. So if I, you know, if I don't get respect from my kids, it's not just, it threatens my identity. You know, if I don't get affection from my wife, it's more than just, oh, I wish you'd kiss me. It's, it threatens my identity. What kind, who am I if I'm not getting what I think I need from the people in my life? Well, when you can say, because Jesus won for me, I'm free to lose, you know what that does? It says, because everything I need in Christ I already possess, I am now free to give everything to you without needing anything from you. That changes everything. If you're struggling in your marriage, the reason you're struggling in your marriage, the reason any of us struggle in our marriage is because we're depending on our spouse to be for us what only Jesus promised to be. That's it. If if you're struggling with your kids, I'm not talking about circumstances that are legitimate. I'm saying down deep, under the surface, the root cause. If you're struggling with your kids, if, if your life is miserable because your kids aren't responding the way you hope they would respond, something else is going on there. I mean, something else is going, like just like me playing tennis. Something else, I mean, I lost a point. You know, but why would I lose my temper in such a dramatic way? Well, because something else is going on there than I might lose the match. I I felt like the flesh was being ripped off my bones. Well, that's the way a lot of us feel too. Well, what, what is it that's going on in those moments? Well, we're trying to secure for ourselves from someone infinitely smaller than Jesus, what only Jesus has promised to give us for free. So because Jesus won for me, I'm free to lose. This is real freedom because Jesus was strong for me, I'm free to be weak. Isn't it exhausting always trying to be strong? It's exhausting. I mean, there's so many people inside the church who pretend. You know, we're we're addicted to pretending. We wear masks, we put our best foot forward. We, you know, it's exhausting. I mean, it's so, exhausting trying to get you to think something about me that's not true, that's better than who I am. It's exhausting. Why do we do it? Because we don't believe the gospel. We don't believe that because Jesus was someone, I'm free to be no one. Why are so many professionals, so many, so many people in the workplace tired? It's not just because they have long days. That's not the only reason that they're tired. They're, they're tired because they, they have to earn respect. They're trying to get to the front. They have to make a name for themselves. Who are they if they don't succeed? That's why, well, Jesus says, because I succeeded for you, you're free to fail. I mean, the gospel of grace frees us from the obsessive pressure to perform, the enslaving demand to become. The gospel liberatingly declares that in Christ we already are. It is finished. So here's the good news. Who you really are has nothing to do with you. Who you really are has nothing to do with you. How much you can accomplish, who you can become, your behavior, either good or bad, your strengths, your weaknesses, your past, your present, your future, your family background, your education, your looks. Who you really are has nothing to do with any of that stuff. Your identity is firmly anchored in Jesus' accomplishment, not yours. His strength, not yours. His performance, not yours. His victory, not yours. That's so, you know, I grew up and I thought that the gospel was for people outside the church. And that once God saves us, we move beyond the gospel into something else, something different, something deeper. But a more careful reading of the Bible shows that once God saves us, he doesn't move us beyond the gospel, he moves us more deeply into the gospel, that the gospel is not just the ABCs of the Christian faith, it's the A to Z of the Christian faith, and this is what I call the now power of the gospel, for Christian people even. It doesn't just save us from the past, and it doesn't just save us for the future, the gospel is the power of God to save us here and now from things like fear and and anxiety and all of that stuff that we heap on ourselves because even as Christian people, we're still trying to secure salvation for ourselves. 
by winning, by being right, by being successful, by churning out well-behaved, emotionally adjusted children, by achieving a good reputation, which can only properly be achieved if you pretend, by the way. You're a lot worse, like I said, a lot worse than you think you are. If, if I'll give you an example. Okay, if you're sitting there going, he doesn't, come on, I'm not that bad. If one week, just one week, forget week, a day, let's make it easy on you. If one day of your Every thought that crossed your mind, okay? Every emotion that went through your heart and everything that you did or failed to do, if one day of that was broadcast with your name and your picture on these screens right now, and we have some of those, so let's roll the, no, I'm just kidding. Um, You would never show your face here again. You are worse than you think you are, okay? You are, I am too, we just are. I mean, if we weren't that bad, we wouldn't need God to come to earth to save us. The moment you start thinking that spiritual growth means I'm getting better and better and more and more competent, Jesus becomes less and less relevant. Christian growth means I'm becoming increasingly aware of how weak and incompetent I am and how strong and competent Jesus continues to be for me. That's Christian growth. It's Paul, it's the Apostle Paul at the end of his life going, I'm the worst guy that I know. I'm the least of all the saints. Let me just close uh, with this. Twice this past year, I have uh, been late for an appointment and have been desperately looking for my keys at home, twice. And I've barked at everybody in my house. My wife, who is the most obsessive compulsive person you'll ever meet in your life, who, and she admits this about herself, so it's okay. She's not gonna be mad at me for saying that. I say it wherever I go. Um, She's the kind of woman who if I have a glass of water and I put it down on the kitchen counter and I walk a foot and a half to the bathroom (laughs) and I'm there for 19 seconds and come back out, the glass is in the dishwasher, okay? (laughs) Um, So I first ask her, did you see my keys, dear? They were right here, a second ago. Um, no, I didn't see them, I didn't touch them. I asked my kids, you know, I'm barking at everybody in the house. I'm barking at my children. I'm barking at all the animals that we have. I'm, you know, I mean, where are my keys? Where are my keys? I'm late, I'm late. They didn't just get up and fly away. Someone took them. Where are they? Where are they? And just at about the time that I'm ready to order mass executions in my home, I go into my bedroom one final time to look for the keys, stick my hand in my pocket, both times, and they were there, okay? Now we laugh because we say, what idiot spends 20 minutes looking for keys that are in his pocket? Well, that may not be your particular problem, um, but that's the way most of us live our lives. We spend our lives frantically searching desperately searching for something that we already possess. And the announcement of the gospel to you and to me is God simply saying, the keys are in your pocket. They're there. I mean, all because of Christ's finished work, Christians already have all of the love and justification and approval and acceptance and significance and security and freedom and validation and righteousness that we desperately long for and that we look for in a thousand things infinitely smaller than Jesus. And so God proclaims, announces to weary, broken sinners like me, the keys are in your pocket. You don't need to frantically search behind every tree and under every rock for those things that in Christ you already possess. Everything you need in Christ you possess. Now you are actually free to spend your life going to the back instead of fighting always to get to the front. Now you're actually free to spend your life giving everything away instead of trying to get everything for yourself. You're free, you need nothing. That's good news. It's good news for exhausted people like you. It's good news for exhausted people like me. Let's pray together. Father, this is so hard to believe. It just seems too good to be true. And so I pray that you 
by your spirit would massage this message down deep into our bones and overpower our unbelief. Cause us to rest and relax in the finished work of Jesus so that we might be able to feel, understand, and experience the freedom that Jesus paid so dearly to secure for sinners like us. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Hey. If you want to... If you want to say hi to uh, Pastor Tolian, he'll be right outside at a table. And I'm going to invite the pastoral support team to come down. and.